Let's look at some stubborn sinners, Abraham and Sarah. If you're paying attention, you might think you're watching a rerun <laughs> in this beginning of the story of the sun, in this grand Amazon Prime series. We're in season one still, maybe season two or three by now, whatever. And you're like, wait, didn't we watch this a few weekends ago? Where the kids went to camp and we got to watch the, and then we were, didn't we watch this episode? Because like that whole she's my sister and whatever. No, 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 wait, that was back in Genesis 12 and that was in Egypt with Pharaoh. Okay, okay, hold on a second. This is kind of hard to believe this is in the Bible. Like, are you saying that Abraham did that whole thing in Egypt and she's my sister and he took her and whatever, and then he finally got her back, and there are these plagues in the Pharaoh's house, and blah, 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 and all this stuff, and, and, and like, you know, Abraham pimped out his wife to cover his own rear end, for honest. He didn't know that someone was going to take her, but he, anyway. Are you saying that after all that, like a dog returns to its own vomit, he did the same dang thing? Yes. That's what I'm saying. And Sarah too. That's what I'm saying. That's what the Bible says. I was also going to call this sermon repeat offenders. <laughs> it is so easy to shake our head and tisk tisk. What a fool. I mean, I wouldn't have done that. I mean... One Pharaoh situation, taking my wife, and, you know, that's enough for me. Man, look at your life. If, you're, if your life story was a Bible story, and I was preaching on your story, or if my life story was a Bible story, and you were preaching on my story, you could also call the sermon repeat offenders, or Christian fill-in-the-blanks. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And that's why this is so stinking encouraging. Let's look at Sarah and Abraham. I'm not going to read the story to you, but just think about Abraham and Sarah. They knew what had happened before. They knew the consequences. Now let's think about how terrible this is. But before we think about how terrible this is, let's put ourselves in their places. We don't know why they traveled to the south, the Negev, from where they were before. We're not sure. It doesn't say there was a famine in the land like when they went to Egypt, but there could have been. They probably weren't just bored and like, hey, let's just take off, you know. Um, yes, they were looking for a city to come, right? But we don't know. But have you ever known what you're supposed to do, but because you were scared, you lied or, or cheated or, or ignored <laughs> something that you, you shouldn't have ignored or whatever? Have you ever done that? You know, we, we all hope that if someone put a chip, put it, we all hope that if someone put a gun to our head and said, if, if you don't renounce Jesus, I'm going to shoot you, we hope that if that was our Bible story, we go, David Balzer, man of faith, he stood the test and he said, shoot me. And they said, yeah, we were just checking to make sure you're a real Christian. Now we have a Bible saying, you know, that's, I want that, I want to be that guy. I don't want to be Peter. Oh, wait, Peter? Yeah, Peter. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy who curses like a sailor the third time, swearing up and down, literally, that I don't know Jesus. I don't want to be that guy. I hope, Lord, give me strength that my faith may not fail. Right? Remember, we talked about this. Jesus prayed that Peter's faith would not fail. He didn't pray that Peter would fail because he knew that Peter would fail. He prays that his faith would not fail. Again, the miracle of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit testifying that 
Your sins are forgiven. Yes, those same sins that you did last night, that you did last week, that you're going to do tomorrow, those same sins are forgiven. Man, it's so easy to judge Abraham, but we are Abraham. How would you feel to be Sarah? I mean, she calls Abraham Lord. You know, wives submit to your husbands in the Lord, right? So, you know, she should not have obeyed Abraham and lied and said she is, you know, he's my brother. But she did. And, and imagine if your husband, I mean... We don't read till this part that this was like a plan that they had. As soon as he left uh, Ur of the Chaldees. So you got Genesis 12, this man of faith. You know, Abraham went not knowing where he was going. Meanwhile, you have this gross sin from the beginning. It was a sinful plan. It was like, I'm going to subscribe to a porn site. That's what they were doing. It was like, this is a big, like, I'm, we are planning this plan B way out. Like, he's following, he went and, like, defeated the kings with Sodom and rescued Lot and Melchizedek and all that stuff. Meanwhile, he had this subscription. He had his own laptop the whole time. His secret laptop. Say you're my sister. It makes me mad. Can you imagine if you were Sarah and your husband was, this is sexual abuse. I know there's younger kids, but I'm not going to go anymore, but that is, this fits the category of that abuse. He did it again. What had just happened earlier? God rained down fire from heaven and consumed Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities of the plain, except Zoar, for the sake of one righteous person. He consumed all these cities. There was this dramatic destruction. Abraham could see the smoke, probably smell the sulfur in the air where he was living. What else had just happened? God had specifically promised that Sarah herself was going to conceive with Abraham and bring forth the seed, the promised one, through whom the Christ was going to come. We can never thwart the plan of God ultimately, but just like in the book of Acts when Paul said, an angel told me that no one, no lives would be lost on the ship when they were going to Rome, and, but he said, but unless those soldiers stay in the boat, we'll all perish. Like those, those are both true. Was God going to allow them to afford his plan? No. But did he use the warning as a means of carrying it out? Yes. Humanly speaking, they were endangering our salvation. Heaven and hell were on the line here, in a sense. Does that make sense? Well, maybe, maybe not, because they could conceive later. But, but the fact that, that God had just promised to Abraham and Sarah that they were going to conceive and have a son... And then he pimps her out again. You know, you've got this plan, but when you see the men taking your wife away, like, hey, oh, you're, you're a sister. Hey, the king would like to meet you. Somehow at like 90 years old, she's still attractive enough for the king to want her in that way. That's pretty amazing. But so, no offense. But so, so they're carrying her away. I mean, in that moment, what would that be like? Wouldn't you feel, men, wouldn't you just feel like the scum of the earth if you had a conscience at all emasculated? These people are carrying away your wife. You're so scared to die. It's like you're not going to trust that God can protect you. You went out to war and kicked all these kings' tails, and now you're scared? What? That's us, man. We are weak. We are surprisingly weak. We're shockingly weak. 
Like when you're watching a when so when, when you're watching a movie of your own life and you're like, wait, we're why now? Are you serious? In that moment, like you could have said, no, no, she's actually my wife. I'm sorry, baby, come back, come back. But he didn't. He just let them take her. What would it be like when you're back together after a bit of like hands are back over? Like you're on the couch, dude, for a while. Let me tell you. So part of the miracle of Isaac's birth is the fact that they even <laughs> slept together after all this junk had happened, right? Not just physically, but psychologically, you know, emotionally, relationally, you know? So that stubborn sin of Abraham and Sarah. But let's look at God's stubborn grace, the shocking nature of the story. The thing that makes that makes it look like God is a respecter of persons. Right? Now, I think what that means is he's not impressed by the things that impress other people. He's like, oh, this guy's a rich guy, so it'll be nicer. But he certainly has mercy on whom he chooses to have mercy. And when he, from all eternity, chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world, you sure as heck better to believe that his love is stuck on you forever. We are members of his flesh and of his bones. He's not going to cut his own leg off. So he'll, he will never cut you off. How united are we to Jesus? We are Jesus. In the sense that a wife and her husband are one. But even more mystically, we are united to Jesus. is that amazing? Look at this stubborn grace. Who's the good guy in the story? And who are the bad guys? Who's the good guy? Shout it out. Abimelech. He's the good guy, right? Who are the Bonnie and Clyde of the story? <laughs> Abraham and Sarah. They might as well be on their way to rob a stinking bank, right? Like, they, they've got their guns and they've got the cool 20s car or whatever. Maybe I'm confusing other people. But anyway, they're the bad dudes in the story. Who prays for who? I mean, like, if I'm writing the story, here's how it would go. Then the Lord came to Abraham in a dream at night and said, What the heck are you doing? Get him back! Are you serious? Are you serious right now? You're about to die. That's if I have if the David Balls are Bible. That's, that's, and that'd probably be your Bible too, right? Because that's how we think God works. Those are our ways. If we wrote the Bible, if we planned people's lives, it would be hell. Because our ways are hell. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of which is death, right? But God's ways are higher than our ways. God's grace is surprising. God's grace like comes into the story where you wouldn't put it, right? Does that make sense? Like it's almost anticlimactic. You know, it just it sneaks in and sneak attacks you. Right? Like God blesses you when you just messed up last night, but you'd had like devotions every day for months and months and then, you know, it, and nothing happened. Like, he just surprises you with his grace and that's what happens here. It's crazy. We know that Abimelech is the good guy. Verse 5, did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. Two witnesses, right? The testimony of two or three witnesses. It's settled. And the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I've done this. God doesn't go, no, you're just a stinking sinner. He knows that he's sinful, but in this matter, he was sinless. Well, he was grabbing another wife. Like, he freaked, like oh, his wife was married? Wait, wait, he already had a wife? Yeah. So that's not good, right? But regarding Sarah in this matter specifically, he, he, he was. Look how God confirms that the good guy of the story is not Abraham, it's Abimelech. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. For I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. You know, work, work out your salvation with fear and trouble. For it is God who works in you, but to willing to do for his good pleasure. He's like, yeah, I'm innocent. He goes, oh, I know you're innocent because I made you innocent. You know, you, you bring a woman, I guess, into his harem. Maybe she was, he treated her like a concubine. I'm not sure how that all worked, but like, 
You don't do them for them to just sit around and knit. Okay? <laughs> the fact that he hadn't touched her was a intervention, providential intervention of God. Men, right? You know? So, yes, God led him in paths of righteousness for his own namesake, right? Abimelech is the shining Sunday school flannel graph hero of the story. But what does God do? God highlights his stubborn grace to Abraham and Sarah. Just shining so, so brightly. Look at verse 7. Now therefore restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet. Now that's the first time that Navi, or whatever that Hebrew word for prophet, is used in, in the scriptures. He is a prophet. He's someone called and sent by me as my representative, God is saying. And he will pray for you, and you shall live. Look, God hears the prayers of a righteous man, right? Yeah. Those who are covered in the righteousness of Christ, yeah. But in this story, who should be praying for whom? Yeah. Right. Abraham should, should have been the one with the capital sentence dream at night. And Abimelech should, should have been the one praying for Abraham. He's the innocent one. Who's innocent in the story? Who's the only innocent character besides him? You know, his wife and household. You know, going to. Abimelech. Abraham and Sarah. Bonnie and Clyde. And, 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 and God says, Clyde, my boy, Clyde will pray for you. I'm not going to heal you until he prays for you. I'm talking to you. You're talking to me. You can ask me all you want. But unless he prays for you, you're not going to be healed. Your household's not going to be healed. That's God's stubborn grace. Is it not? Now, we don't want to take that for granted. God chastens those he loves. And unrepentant pattern of your life, fornicators and adulterers will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven, right? So don't be deceived. God is not mocked. And yet, you know that. And that's probably not where you're at this morning. Because you have the Holy Spirit. And yeah, we you know we we need to hear this. We need to hear this. Who acts as a priest as well as a prophet in a sense? Abraham here. He will pray for you and you shall live, but if you do not restore or know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. This covenantal responsibility thing, this unity of the family. So, I won't read the whole thing again to you, but here you have verse 9, Abimelech rebuking Abraham. As a side note, God uses non-believers. Now, maybe he knew the Lord. We don't know. I mean, it's sort of interesting how they're interacting. Maybe he hopefully came to the Lord through this. Now, if God said, you know, ask Abraham to pray for you, maybe he didn't know the Lord anyway. But, so... Assuming he didn't know the Lord yet, even though the Lord was talking to him, he wasn't savingly like, trusting him. I don't know. Maybe he was. He kept anyway. But God uses pagan-looking kings to rebuke the church. And this is something that reminds us of God's at least common grace. You know, we listen to music made by non-Christians, right? We, we have conversations with family members who don't know Jesus, and they're actually a lot nicer than we are. So, you know, they, like, they have a lot of wisdom, humanly speaking, right? In God's common grace, God can rebuke the church through the non-believers. So on our fourth week of love group each month, when we say we're receiving and reflecting God's love through and to the world, that is not blasphemy, that is not syncretism, that is not worldly thinking. That is, God's going to gather us among non-Christians, and some of those non-Christians are going to tip their waitress way better than you would. You know, some of those non-Christians are going to are going to love you better than your jerky Christian aunt or whatever. You know, that, that God's going to love you through people who don't yet know Him. I have very close family members who would give their life for me. They don't know Jesus yet. You better believe He loves me through them. So we receive and reflect God's love through Abimelech. That's what God's doing here. He's rebuking Abraham. How have I offended you? Why did you do this? Abraham gives the, well, he says I was scared, but then he also does the, technically she's my sister, she's my half-sister. 
that's kind of a weird family situation. So, but then he, here, here you, you have this, this thing where Abraham ends up getting blessed and not punished. Verse 14, then Abimelech took sheep and oxen, just like Pharaoh did. In Genesis 12, sheep, oxen, and male and female servants, and gave them to Abraham, and he restored Sarah's wife to him. And Abimelech said, See, my land is before you, wherever it pleases you. Like, man, no bad deed goes unrewarded in this story. <laughs> you know, you talk about no good deed goes unpunished. When you let someone out traveling, they slow down, you almost wreck it, actually, let you over anyway. No bad deed goes unrewarded if you're Abraham. I mean, he really came out squeaky clean. I mean, he came out. Great, if you're watching the episode at the end, you're like, dude, man, I'll pimp out my wife. You know, like, what, what? This unbelievable grace. Now, this goes back to our previous sermons for the last month or so. The scandal of grace. Justice and mercy. The, the dilemma. How can a good God treat Abimelech and Abraham in the way he does. It looks like he just got the names mixed up. Mm -hmm. Right? How can a good God do that? Because in Romans 3, how, how can a good God do that for you? Because in Romans 3 it says that he had passed over the sins that were previously committed. He didn't sweep them under the rug. He had passed over them to place them on Christ. So that at the present time he might be demonstrated to be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God can be good and treat Abraham this way. God did not ignore Abraham's sin. Yes, he chastens us in this life anyway, but it looks like, dude, he robbed the bank and then now he's living in a mansion and he's healthy and happy. He's got more camels and sheep and goats and servants and musicians and all this stuff. Like, what? <laughs> Jesus took the wrath against Abraham's sexual abuse. That's how God can be good and treat Abraham and treat you and me that way. That stubborn grace comes from through a secured salvation. It was given to us before the foundation of the world, but you know what I mean? There is a secure, successful sufficient salvation that was accomplished at the cross for you. And there is a real can't undo it adoption that you've been given in Christ. That's why God justifies you and sanctifies you. Because he chose you for adoption. Adoption is the heart. It's the umbrella that all the other things fall under. So then what happened? Verse 17, so Abraham prayed to God. I'm almost done. So Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants. Then they bore children, for the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. I mean, that's a long time for him not to touch Sarah. I'm just saying. That's pretty amazing. It's also amazing that God actually heard Abraham's prayer. It's also amazing that he never once rebukes Abraham in the story. Like, are you serious? What is this? Stop your mourning and your weeping. Let go of your spirit of heaviness and, and take up the freely given garment of praise that comes from the garment of Christ's righteousness covering you. Stop being Satan to yourself or to others and embrace the joy of your Lord. Embrace His stubborn grace as you remember that it is finished. Amen.